Well, I, you know, just take me on a journey. Why and what provoked you to write this piece? Uh, what provoked me? You know, I, often... I what I mean is what motivated you. What I mean by provocation, I don't mean you know you were angry and you got provoked. I just mean all the thoughts and ideas that swam in your head. What? How did this appear? And what genre is it? Is it a memoir? Do you think of it that you were writing a memoir? Do you think of it as a history? Do you, I, I just want you to explore the beginnings of this. Very passionate about history and my profession is journalism. So, you know, yeah. it's the, what I bring into this book is a combination of mm -hmm. uh, literature which encourages you to use your imagination unlike the historian who hates imagining things and is looking for facts uh, but a lot of history uh, from primary sources and from uh, uh, a lot of work done in Lucknow uh, in the English language because like I've made it my mission to, uh, to uh, write about Lucknow for non-Urdu Hindi speaking readers who, um, who know English and do not know Urdu. So uh, that is the style. But when I was writing this book, mm -hmm. I was not conscious of any genre. You know, I was not conscious I, uh, of um, uh, uh, references. You know, it was like, uh, uh, the reportage of a of a reporter, you know. Yes, so, that's what I found. I thought it was more journalistic, yes. more episodic, and so, didn't have the structure of yeah thematic thought, structure or chronological structure or anything like that. Unconsciously, I followed uh, uh, whatever discipline. Um, journalists work uh, uh, under. So it's a uh, it's um, and then uh, because I was asked to do this work uh, to write this book and they have a format you know the mm -hmm. format is a short biography so you know you uh, it can't be you know an academic uh, 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 book with uh, you know 70 pages of bibliography and references so I've just followed the instructions given to me by my publisher but because the publisher uh, is Alif a book company I was mm. very um, honored uh, to to write this book for them and what prompted me to write this particular book uh, is of course the publisher Mm -hmm. You know, Alif uh, asked me to uh, join their, uh, their series called Iconic Cities of uh, Lucknow. And they have a series of uh, books on different uh, cities of the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was asked to, um, uh, to write about Lucknow. And I was delighted because um, in the last decade or so, I've uh, done... Um, um, I've worked only on Lucknow. I've just finished a book on uh, uh, Urdu poets uh, writing in Lucknow in the 19th century, which is an absolutely exhilarating theme. Mm -hmm. And uh, very, very uh, joyfully, you know, I've documented in English and uh, for non-Urdu uh, speaking, knowing uh, readers. Uh, uh, an entire book on all the poets. It seems uh, in 19th century Lucknow, there were uh, poets, you know, growing wild in the city like, uh, like you know, uh, grass, you know, every corner uh, mm -hmm. uh, had sprouted a poet or two. So I finished that. It's just, uh, I think, uh, for a long time, maybe for three decades or so, uh, I've got very, very interested in Lucknow and uh, uh, learned a lot about my own city from a lot of the work you've done on Lucknow. Like uh, 
colonial Lucknow was an eye opener for me. Uh, uh, a, a life of resistance was fascinating uh, to read about the Tawaifs and, and the, 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 the place of honor that they had enjoyed in, uh, in the 18th and 19th century in this part of the world. And also, I will never forget how what an eye opener it was when I read in your book that this was a group of women who were the only female citizens of the city who were economically independent. And that was like, you know, you got a silent accolade <laughs> for having uh, documented that piece of information. And uh, very often the the position or the, the life of a courtesan was uh, even uh, better than the life of a queen or a, a fairy in the, in the ruler's um, uh, entourage. Well, you know, they were not only independent, they were the highest earners yes. Yes. in the city. And, and the way I found that out is because I got hold of the 1862 tax record which is still sitting in, you know, in the archive in Mahanagar. And it, it was such a shock. The top, top layer, I thought, you know, it will be um, the jewelers, it will be the traders, it will be, you know, the, the whole marketing scene. Top one, dancing, singing girls. That's what they were called. Dancing and singing girls and boon companions. Boon companions being those that, you know, had uh, some sort of connection with the court and they had incomes. But the highest paid were the highest incomes and they didn't declare all their income, by the way. I talked to them and they said, Are jao, kabhi batane wale hum log. Bata diya thoda sa phir bhi itta tax ho. You know, that what they even the time, disclosed. Veena, uh, by the time you did your research on the Kothe Valleys, Hmm. They were no longer courtesans, right? They were common. They, you see, this was the last gasp, as it were. I had no idea that they even existed anymore because I, I, I met them in 1975. The emergency had been declared, if you recall. Yeah. And so, you know, I said, Are, hey, I'm now to go to these government offices is going to be very problematic. But that was solved because um, Mahmood Butt, who I called Uncle Mahmood, who used to play bridge with my parents, lovely man, he was the chief secretary. And I my father said, go to Mahmood's office, tell him you need to go get into all the government offices. But they were all very frightened of the emergency. So I went and he said, he, he called his man, Chai Lao, or Jitne departments hai, sab mein itla kar do ke ek veena talwar Oldenburg aayengi unki kuch maange, kuch bhi na na ho. And my God, was it wonderful to have such a backing because I would go and they would put a surahi, they would bring, you know, samosa and chai. I said, this is not what I want. I just want to see the documents. This you can, you know, don't waste money on me. I can eat all this somewhere else. I don't want to dirty my fingers even. I have to write. Then comes, there was this one thing which was completely closed. You know, seals like you in the lala. So I said, is me kya hai? He said, are wo khatoot, jo Wajid Ali saa ke khatoot, khatoot, unho ne jo intercept kiye the, wo hai is me. I said, ye kisi ne nahi dekhe? He said, nahi, kya karne dekhe? Ab to ho chuka, ab to khatam, you know. I said, nahi, nahi, khatam nahi, abhi shuruat. Please open it. So in front of me, they opened the thing and they took out these vellum pellicule, you know, that is a very nice thick linen. And in the most beautiful Nastali, but so beautifully done that I couldn't tell you that it was a script. It was like a painting, one letter after another. So I said, Toba, Toba, now my little Urdu, which I, I was learning to read it because in school we weren't taught anything, as you know. In La Martinia, we were taught English. And when you became came to seventh class or something in my time, you learned Hindi. 
So I am stumped because I have learned Urdu by myself sitting at home, but Urdu Lipi, a little book. I couldn't read this stuff. So I go to the Persian department and I find my friend who I call, um, he was called Chadju, but I don't say, he, he was called Chadju, but I, he said, just call me Chotemia. So I called him Chotemia. He used to go on a bicycle. I would drive in my car. He would not sit. He would say, nee, nee, nee. Main wapis kaise So he would, and I would go slowly through. And he said, Aap, ye khat mujse rahe. this was in the archive. Aap milna in se? Jo, eh, eh, se, you know, these, the wives. So I said, he said, Chali, meri nani. I said, your nani? He said, ah, tabhi to mere paas naam nahi hai. Bar bar hai aap. You see, I had, to, I had a scholarship from the American Institute of Indian Studies, which paid me a lot of money in those days. So I, I said, I'm going to give you a salary for doing this. Tum mere lag jao. Jahan bhi Urdu ka hoga. So he said, I said, but naam theek se do na. Ye chote miya, chadju, adju, nahi chalta. Oh, you have to give me a proper name so I can submit your bills to this to get reimbursed. I don't have the money to just give you. So he said, to hoti, to hoti. Cycle pe ghumta, motor pe ghumta. I said, what are you saying? This is all upside down. Ladku. And that's what... Yes. Persuaded me that ये कौन कौन सा काम है ये कौन सी लोग हैं जो who give so much अहमियत to women. Then I went and met his nani and she I fell in love with her in about thirty seconds because she was sitting with a panda and I have photos of a silver panda which was the diameter of. May I make a suggestion because you talk about poets and you have written and now your latest book is on poetry. The one thing I missed in when you were dealing with the poets and you give your translation, I was seeking the original because you can't judge a translation unless you know what the original is. Yeah. And since you don't give the original, I even went to the back and I didn't find the original. So I... Um, I can't judge how good the translation is. And I can't judge what is being said in Urdu because, you know, the zaika and the, the full feeling of the original yes. is because trans, uh, translation is often called, at least among academic circles, transcreation. You're creating your own view of what you think you're writing. So it can't ever be exactly what the poet wanted. So for that reason, I hope in your next work, you will put in, in Roman, you know, so that people can read it or I think in, we, in, in we, the Hindi script. We deleted a lot of um, uh, the original uh, and just uh, tried to capture the spirit of what was said in the poetry because uh, my editor said this is not a book about poetry and poets it's mm -hmm. a book about the city so I think uh, uh, that made sense to me and I totally disagree with your I know who your publisher is and I think that you know this whole thing I, I have a problem with even iconic city um, as a city historian, there are many genres of cities right. there. You know, if you just look at the colonial um, aspect, the first set of cities they built were port cities. Madras was their very first. If you look at the map of Madras in 1640, which I had the pleasure of looking at in the East, uh, in those days it was called the British India Office Library, and the original map which was the map of the Fort St. George of Madras, you suddenly saw, and that's what gave me the idea of Lucknow, saw the core of what colonial needs were. There was a hospital, 
there was a chapel, there were two pubs, two pubs compared to one chapel. Graveyard. And, yeah, and then there were barracks, there were bungalows of, you know, the officers, there, were, there was a cricket ground, there was a this, there was a that. And I suddenly got the key to thinking in a better way about this. Now you look at a hill station. Why did they build them? There were already people living in the hills, but they build hill stations because of the heat and dust, which was, you know, commonly lamented. It's a good place to be, but for the heat and dust. So they would move the whole capital out of wherever, even Calcutta, you know, they went up to Darjeeling. In Lucknow, they went up to Nenital. Even from Allahabad, they went to Nenital. Um, when Allahabad was the capital. So you find that there's a port city, there's a city of, in the hills which resembled British village cities. You know, they, they, they had very nice, you know, the, the, those houses that you see now very few left in places like Masuri and Simla. Simla in particular is a, is a capital they built and very few people have actually written on it or said anything about it. But I went around checking out these cities. Then, the there's the, the then there's a third variety, which is places like Lucknow, which already were cities and were provincial capitals, like Awadh's capital was in Lucknow, used to be Faisabad. Then it moved in 1775 to Lucknow. And how they reorganized the built environment. So that happens to Lucknow only after. First, they lived quite, you know, meddling and so on and so forth and living in the residency and had the cantonment across the river, by the way, which, which had to be, which was their they saw was the major mistake that when the siege occurred, they could just block the bridge and no troops could come. And that's why the siege could last that long till they, they you know, captured the bridges again, reopened that. And the first thing they do, I think I've described all this in my Lucknow. Right. The making of colonial Lucknow was to move the cantonment into uh, that you know area where Mohammed Bagh Club was built and so on and the parade grounds and all those wide streets with those bungalows for officers which you know very well but that is a third style of city now iconic city what is iconic can we take the clock tower to be you know Lahore has a clock tower which my grandfather built by the way still exists with his name on it, on the mall road. But is that the icon? What is? What do you take to be the icon of Lucknow? And you say your very first sentence, which took me aback. I put my feet up and said, hey, wait a minute. There is nothing iconic in today's Lucknow. That's There's your statement. Special. There's nothing. Defend that statement. Defend it. You know, when... when um... Uh, when I was thinking, uh, I was told to be part of this uh, uh, series of books called Iconic Cities. Um, of course, the origin of the word icon is, you know, Christian religious. and religious. But I was, and uh, I reduced it to um, what is so special about, uh, you know, the special cities of the country. I interpreted it that way, you know, without, actually, I, maybe I should have discussed uh, this with, uh, with people before uh, starting my book by saying there's nothing. But what I mean, the context here is that Lucknow once upon a time was a very special city. And perhaps today it is not that special. Mm -hmm. Well, wouldn't you say, I mean, if I was to pursue Lucknow, when you say it was a very special city, do you mean during the Nawabi? Or no, did no. it remain special through the col colonial period? And why do you think it has lost its importance today? 
because you know when i saw that i thought you were referring only to the nawabi but when i read it you are in far greater praise of the colonial aspects of the city than you are even of the nawabi and when you look at what was iconic about lucknow if it is things like you know the imam baras and the husainabad clock tower and chota imam bara in uh, husainabad uh, they all exist in fact the jama masjid which was totally destroyed shish mahal which was destroyed uh, butler palace you know many things that were destroyed were actually restored in some ways you know and who should do it the aga khan he comes along with his you know great he's a enormously fantastic guy and he has saved so many buildings from ruin lucknow is more ruined because of the mutiny as you must have read in my book three fifths of the city is rubbled how can you then what i recall about my own book hmm. uh, the uh, lucknow enjoyed an importance in different ways in different eras i don't recall um uh, praising unnecessarily a colonial lucknow but mm-hmm. um, it was important before no, us- it's not unnecessary it's a very very important part which is what has dominated now but, what you get today is a colonial lucknow but uh, from from uh, what i remember i wrote this book two two three years ago so i'm mm-hmm. forgetting the entire text but uh, uh, i start off from even when lucknow was not an imperial capital of uh, asifuddola it was uh, it had a different kind of importance like it was the most important ganj or granary treasure house of uh, all the edible goodies that uh, were harvested on the very fertile mm-hmm. indo-gangetic plains in this part of the world harvested and then collected uh in uh, in lucknow to be sold here to even traders coming to lucknow from the great silk route so yeah. the, lucknow was important in different ways in different eras this is how i recall um uh, talking about lucknow from the earliest history like the earliest uh, information about lucknow is of course mythological that ram didn't want his beloved brother to be too far away from him so ram was ruling in ayodhya and he gave uh, this part of the land to lakshman so that he would not be he would be close enough to ayodhya mm-hmm. and that is well, there, are, there are stories i mean you know i yes. feel that uh, you know the epics have all manner of stories and some of them are yeah, there's some some traces of that in the Lak- uh, yeah. lakshman so, tila and so, so on so when yes but uh, uh, also when uh, when uh, uh, muhammad amin you know the persian burhanul mulk came and overpowered the sheikhs and the 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 pathans who had built machi bhavan and were um, uh, almost you know de facto rulers of the city Uh, then uh, the rest of lucknow was just a, cl- a cluster of uh, very dusty um, uh, villages of different communities engaged in various kinds of agricultural activities like fishermen and uh, people farmers who grew vegetables and uh, that was it and then it it much much later uh, asifuddola then in in ancient times in this region called avadh it was never lucknow that was the capital ever of anything or yeah. uh, that's why it, it, it was yeah, it kashi yes. it was kashi it was uh, kannauj it was mm-hmm. even uh, you know cities which have become suburbs now like bijnor and jaunpur for example you know mm-hmm. uh we get a lot of our uh, sufi saint traffic uh, that travel from delhi first to jaunpur because jaunpur was this glittering capital of mohammed bin uh, uh, tughlaq 
uh, who was called uh, Jauna Khan. And he, uh, in this part of the world, that Jaunpur was his eastern capital. And, and Murshidabad, you have, yeah, that, that may well be true, but the iconic part, the only part left, you know, of that whole Nawabi period in physical terms is in fact the iconic part. That's what I was trying to sort of quarrel with because I said... Uh, it what is, it what is you there, mean but it, it also uh, is a shadow, only a shadow of its past. You know, yeah. whatever uh, uh, is left in Lucknow mm -hmm. is... Okay, really you've, you've put... You've, now put your finger on my, really my most central question. I see Lucknow as a city that grows out of two traumas. You know, it's changes, the very radical shifts that occur in Lucknow happen one with the Ghadar of 1850, uh, six, I would put it from 56 to 58, because 56 is when Bajid Ali Shah is uh, asked to give his uh, sign the treaty of, of uh, annexation, and he refuses, and then goes to Calcutta to get his justice. It's not forthcoming. He sends his wife and his son to... Huh? Aha, that of course. He leaves Lucknow singing... Ba, uh, Babul Mora, yeah. Nahir Chuto Jai. Nahir Chuto Jai, which all of us have ha had it ring in our ears because it was one of the most moving uh, songs that he wrote. He was, he was a fabulous poet too. And he, what happens is that the, when the colonials take over, I, I have done that in great detail, what happens, you know, the fabric is destroyed and a lot of the institutional buildup, like the Parikhana is almost, you know, taken over, the uh, Chathar, the Badi Chathar Manzil becomes the Central Drug Research Institute later, but, you know, in the meantime, it's used as offices. Many, uh, even the Jama Masjid is completely destroyed because they want that stronghold to go. They felt this was where people congregate regularly and who knows how much more rebellion might be caused. So they get rid of those mosques, that mosque and several others. And you find in this, the second trauma, when you say shadows of the past, the lengthening shadow, and I think the deepest shadow is the shadow of the partition. And that I feel is untreated. It's not just missing, but it confuses one as to why your last chapter has very rightfully, I, I think it, it's bold and clear and much you has to be written, that kind of work. But it's build up isn't there. You know, you suddenly just skip over what all is going on, Muslim separatism, the demand for Pakistan. Well, it, if you even had begun with uh, 1936 elections, you know, where the, yes, the Lucknow Pact between uh, the two, but what happens? Why does it break apart? What, what falls apart? A little bit. Urdu, which was syncretic, which was assimilative, which was a language created with, you know, the structure of Hindi and vocabulary from Arabic, Persian, but also other languages, which you point out, is now become the absolute identifier of Muslims and Hindi, which really has a, you know, Sanskritic and other kinds of vocabulary from other places. It's really the vocabularies. The language is one. No linguist is going to assign these as two separate languages. What is very different is the script. The script was the divisive point. The whole argument, I just wish for Christ's sake, they had said, all right, take out both scripts, write in Roman. That's what we have been learning, write in Romanese. And let 
the language would have flourished. So what becomes the great language, and I think the most beautiful language that there is, becomes such a backwater because its script is not taught anywhere. The colonials will not teach it. They absolutely refuse even one. You know, I, I even remember going up to my teacher, Miss Calton, who used to teach me Hindi. And I said, why don't you teach us Urdu also? My grandmother writes only in Urdu and I can't read her letters because she was from Raul Pindi. So I said, you know, and they just looked at me like I was this creature who needs to be, you know, choked at the neck because I was talking bad things. And this is, I'm talking in the 1950s, you know, late 50s. I, I uh, finished my O-levels in 61. So it was in that period that I was talking to my teachers and complaining about not having Urdu as a script. Just give us the script. We learn the language. No script was given. So you find that the buildup of separatism, we have blamed the British enough for saying they said divide and rule, which they did, I do agree. But there's a huge surge of separatism which demands a religious state. There are only two religious states created that way, Israel and Pakistan. Pakistan. But when I talk about the progressive writers movement, uh, uh, you know, the... But most of them went to Pakistan. Fez, Atiyah Hussain, you know, when you think of it, no, Fez what did not was progressive. And he was already in Pakistan. Who went to Pakistan was uh, Rashid Jahan and uh, Intazar Hussain. You know, mm -hmm. so these were people who went. Fez was already in Pakistan. So, uh, Fez is a Punjabi, think, he, but he wrote the best Urdu you can find. However, what really hurt both Lucknow and I think the rest of the country, even where partition was not seen or heard, is the departure of the Muslim middle class. Exactly. They left. They voted with their feet. There was no loyalty towards something that was, wouldn't be an Islamic state. What happens is families get divided. Yes, because properties were still in Lucknow. So how can you all pick up and go? So you leave a brother here, you leave a uncle there, you leave a, you know, somebody else who can claim that property. And it becomes a very, um, shall we say, it's not about India anymore. It's about property. It's about, you know, how can we, because if you talk about minorities and majorities, when have the Muslims ever been a majority? Almost anywhere where they have gone, you know, taken over lands. You find that unless you have mass conversions, like you might have had in, you know, Arabia and uh, that whole area, those were mass conversions uh, to Islam. But in other parts, you find that they have lived very you know, they live in America, they're a minority. But no, who in, would in, ever in, refuse in, a ticket to America? In India, the Muslims did not have the numbers, but what they had was power and wealth. And that is why they could uh, rule, they could, they could uh, maintain their power and wealth for nearly a thousand years, you know. So, um, and it was not a one vote kind of a democracy. So they didn't feel the need, you know, to, to convert and to, uh, uh, to have uh, the numbers as long as they were able to, to rule in a fairly peaceful manner, they continued to do so. And that is uh, also one very good reason to uh, write repeatedly and to repeat the history of Lucknow over and over again, because to me, it seemed like almost a state policy by the minority uh, rulers of Awad, who were not only a religious minority, but they were a minority within the, their own religious community. And how did they manage, you know, to create this born homie, this uh, togetherness, this inclusiveness, uh, uh, you know, for uh, 
I mean, for a very short while, uh, in, in historical terms, it was a rule of only 80 years, but they managed to, uh, to sprinkle upon the people of this region with such cosmopolitanism, with such multiculturalism, which mm -hmm. they felt was the only way as a minority, they could rule over a majority. Yeah. Well, let me uh, complicate that too, because while we talk about communal harmony, and I went and looked at every riot, you know, that, that occurred during the Nawabi, and I'm very close to Michael Fisher, who wrote On the Nawabi. I think it's one of the best books. It doesn't get the same, uh, the same heft as uh, Rosie Llewellyn Jones's work does, because she writes more attractively than he can. He's a very serious academic. He writes differently. No, I'm not more Shia Sunni riots. To you, just to interrupt uh, you, I'm not saying that there were no riots or there was there was always tension. There was always tension between Hindus and Muslims. not between Hindus and Muslims, between no, Shia and Sunni. No, also Hindus and Muslims. If you remember, it was Wajid Ali Shah who sent uh, a, a battalion to uh, uh, Ayodhya. Uh, you know, when the Muslims were preventing the Hindus from doing something at the Babri Masjid, you know. So Wajid Ali Shah wanted both communities to be able to use the premises, you know, for uh, mm -hmm. whatever reason. So, but what I'm trying to say is that whenever there, there was the tension either between Sunnis and Shias or Hindus and Muslims or uh, uh, Dalits and Brahmins uh, threatened to escalate, the administration came down strongly and prevented the escalation from happening. And that was, you know, uh, uh, something very positive that held the, the so society together. Exactly. And that's where uh, the story of Lucknow becomes uh, relevant to contemporary life because for almost a hundred years, Lucknow and the Abad region enjoyed a, a sense of peace, you know, that sometimes threatened to become uh, 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 warlike and, and tensions escalated, but the administration always made sure that it did not uh, become a riot of uh, bloodshed. And this well, is the you know, Perhaps, but when the British in the 1920s, you know, especially when Gandhi gets comes back in 1919, and then he starts to organize these large things, the only uh, and I've written on this in some other article or the other, um, the only riot that occurs in Lucknow, not in Ayodhya, not anywhere outside, but in the city of Lucknow, was created and a report was written on it. It's the, uh, the riot of 1924. There's a book, uh, which is a, you know, the British papers on what. And they paid someone or a whole gang to go and throw pork in the mosque and beef in the temple. And that is how that was created. So <laughs> the Nizamat, you know, the British were very happy to have the support of by the Muslims and not of the Hindus. By 1926, the British realized that they would have to soon leave the Indian subcontinent, but uh, oil was also discovered in the Persian Gulf in 1906. And the thought that they could not abandon this region and, and, and uh, leave the, uh, the oil found uh, uh, in this region for the Russians to come in through the corridor of Afghanistan. And that is when they support, they start, began to like the idea of the Muslim League for a separate uh, a Muslim uh, nation so that uh, Pakistan would remain a Western friendly country in this region to keep an eye on the natural resources of this area. 
and this is true to this day you know the the russians come into afghanistan then pakistan is used to build up the mujahideen to get rid of the the yeah the, that but, is so by 1926 the british had were you know it was the muslims who were the most angry with the british for having sent uh, bahadur shah zafar to burma and um, uh, wajid ali had to uh, go mm-hmm. to calcutta so for half a century it was the muslims who were sulking and hated the british uh, uh, most but mm-hmm. by the early 20th century It uh, turns. It, it turned. It turned. Actually, it turned. Well, I I've done this. I mean, taught this a lot. So, 1872, with that book which said, uh, you know, more or less, Islam in danger, and why why are the Muslims disloyal to Queen Victoria, or whatever? And that book. The Muslims were disloyal. Then realized, realized the British because... realized that now we have to cultivate. Uh, a muslim loyalty and yeah. and like may that even upset so the hindus become much more involved in the freedom movement and so on and no i was talking about the middle class it's a very important um development in the colonial period because if you see the nawab you know there were the nawabs and then there were the people who served them the middle class is missing there there wasn't any but what happens in the colonial period is there are professors lawyers doctors of both communities but when the partition happens these people feel they'll get better jobs yeah. in pakistan because pakistan has developed nothing punjab is you know um, doesn't have the same heft as up had up had and that is why urdu is even become the language of pakistan where 5% of the people were speakers of urdu yeah, 95 were not 95% were not the muslim uh, professional class middle class upper middle class was also very culturally chauvinistic they thought nobody had a language like they did uh, nobody knew how to sit the way they sat nobody knew how to speak all this uh, you know tehzeeb tamiz um, uh, akhlaq and uh, uh, nafasat and nazakat was turned became you know um, it, uh, was practiced in a fundamentalist extreme way and they thought that you know they were the cats own whiskers and they would uh, Uh, not have to compete you know with the infidels where once democracy uh, came into india and nehru was a was definitely you know a welfare state a socialist um, and uh, yeah, then the land reforms and they mm-hmm. would uh, you know because one brother was a landlord in the sub, in the kasbas and another brother was um, uh, a high official in the police force so they mm-hmm. were afraid uh, of losing their privileges in a democratic india so yeah, democracy it, has been ve- a very frightening prospect in islam because even though they believe you know if you read i'm sure you read the quran and so on and so have i um that there is an idea of equality but it is never put into practice even it the was muslim put into practice only in the lifetime of muhammad when he was sitting in madina for 10 years and creating the ideal uh, muslim state and yeah. then there Umar. was absolute equality you know when bilal who was a african slave was his chains were cut and he was uh, the prophet said that you know you have such a beautiful voice and he was given the equal status of uh, uh, alim and uh, he was asked by the prophet to say the first uh, call to prayer so it is he be from uh, bilal the slave he became hazrat bilal you know because he uh, gave 
with his beautiful voice, he gave the he climbed up on the mosque and gave the first call to prayer. So for 10 years in Medina, we have the Medina Charter. Where... Talking about the seventh century. I'm talking, let's not, you know, this is what I found very disturbing in the book was that there's no um You'll talk in one minute about the Nawabi and the second minute about some someone who came from Austria. You know, that kind of... They're late. Yes, in oh, Medina. Late. You know, in Medina also, if you remember, the fight over uh, in, in Iraq, in Karbala, that's when Shia and Sunni are created, after his death and when Ali is not recognized. Some people are the friends of the prophet and the other are his family. I know the creation of that division and that lasts today. Why? Yeah. Well, what is the but meaning it, of that? It, no, it got linked to larger issues like uh, the, uh, the Shias. Um, Shiaism was mostly developed and flourished in Iran because the people of Iran are ethnically different to the Arab people. Uh, who yeah, it's, race. it's racism, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. so uh, there is, that is why we go back to Medina to when God said, let there be light and there was light and therefore we are sitting. My question to this is, why was there no big Sufi movement in Lucknow to sort of bridge this? And also, you know, I've, I've lived a lot in, off and on in Sirinagar because my mother, you know, after they left Lahore, their base moved more or less to Kashmir where, you know, Maharaja no, Ranjit. I can came. answer that. I can answer that because, you know, there are other cities like Delhi, for example, you know, which is close enough yeah. to Lucknow. As a Nizamuddin, you know, look at the yeah, wonderful... So things that we all attend. So we can compare uh, Lucknow to uh, Delhi. Why Delhi is spiritually endowed with more the presence to this day uh, of many more Sufis than Lucknow. Because you see, uh, Sufism, if you go back to uh, Moinuddin Chishti, who made, who came at the age of 50 years from wherever Khorasan and Bukhara and Samarkand and made a home not on the border of the Indian subcontinent, but in the heartland in Ajmer. So mm -hmm. this was a very, this was a very tense moment when Muhammad Ghori had just conquered uh, Delhi and the Muslims were for the first time in history planning to live in India, unlike Ghazni who would come, uh, raid, loot and go back. Yeah. So uh, Sufism was parallel to the uh, military activities of the Muslims. Wherever there was war, a Sufi saint uh, uh, sprouted to talk about love in times of hate. So uh, Delhi was a very contentious city. It was, you know, being contested. Uh, so was um, uh, uh, Ajmer. And therefore, in, if you look back on the places, different cities in, uh, in uh, India that are more spiritual than Lucknow, it is because Lucknow till very late in history was just a... Uh, a uh, wholesale grain market. And by the time Asif Uddallah made it his imperial capital, uh, it, uh, the, the peaceful times were already there because the British had uh, uh, prevented Shuja Uddallah after the two battles of Plazi and Baksar, forbade the Nawabs to have an army of their own. So in peaceful times, you don't need a Sufi. There's no need to talk about love when love is in the air. But you know, having, we, having said that, we still have, you know, uh, in the 14th century, we have Shah Mina, you know, who yes. comes, who yes. travels from yes. Delhi, but 
skips Lucknow because Lucknow was insignificant to politically. Uh, it was agriculturally important and therefore economically, but politically and culturally, Lucknow had no role to play. So Shah Mina is born in Delhi and he travels to the glittering, glimmering, affluent uh, capital of Mohammed bin Tughlaq in Jaunpur. He spends time there. And because he cannot stand perhaps the politics of the day, he looks for, you know, a, a quiet, peaceful corner to sit and meditate and to read and write. And he makes Lucknow his home because his teacher was here. So you have Shamina, then you have Peer Muhammad in the in 1694, I think he died, who is buried on the Lakshman Tila next to the Tilewali Masjid, you know? And then mm -hmm. there is this fabulous book edited by um, our dear friend Muzaffar Ali mm -hmm. called uh, The Leaf Turns Yellow. And uh, it has, it's full of interesting essays, but also at the end of the book is a beautiful map, you know, marking all the, 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 the pilgrimage places uh, where Shufi shrines all over mm -hmm. Abad exist. Mm -hmm. So I think Lucknow became the imperial capital in such peaceful times, unlike Delhi and Ajmer and you know, down south where Gezu Daraz went. So the, the Chishti especially sent their disciples and messengers to places that were burning with hate and war and, and were quarrelsome to go mm -hmm. and mediate and talk to people about making love and not war. So mm -hmm. I think uh, Lucknow was fairly affluent and peaceful and uh, but there are uh, a lot of uh, shrines of unknown Sufis who are buried here, but uh, they're not as famous as Nizamuddin Aulia. But Shah, uh, Shah Meena and uh, Shah Peer Muhammad were both from the Chishti uh, uh, Silsila, uh, just like um, uh, Nizamuddin Aulia, Moinuddin Chishti, and Salim Chishti of Agra. Uh, no, you, explain, you explain some of it, actually. You say the Firangi Mahalis were not very inclusive. Uh, for example, they I, I, I got a bit of a shock. No. I, I go to Jama Masjid. Philip, my husband, spent a year in that. Uh, his PhD is on that old city of Delhi, uh, and which became a book. And we go regularly to the old city, you know, and go to the Jama Masjid and so on and so forth. And we go to Kareem's to have our dinner and what have you. When I came to Lucknow, I was told, you know, the Jama Masjid has been restored. So I was very pleased. We drove straight away to it. And there's a big notice. You can go and see it. You live there. No non-Muslim is allowed. So when I went, as part of the rise of communism. Yeah. Uh, so then I, I said, what are you doing? Why are you putting up this notice? Even if that is what you want, remove this notice. It is not a good idea to have such a notice. Destroyed it. One important reason to keep again and again talking in different ways about Lucknow. Because not because... Um, uh, of the song and dance of Wajid Ali Shah, uh, um, which was beautiful anyways. But how the day-to-day -day activities, how the government made sure that there was peace on the streets of the city, um, even though sometimes, you know, people were enraged and they killed each other. It was never hunky-dory, but you have to discourage violence and uh, not encourage yeah. it, you know? Absolutely. This is the Absolutely. difference between, that is what we have to keep, it's so simple, you know? But we have to keep 
emphasizing that in Lucknow, the history of Lucknow plays a very important role in keeping that spirit of unity and diversity alive. You know, Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb has become a joke. People, you know, make fun know, of uh, Lucknow Walas. What do you mean Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb? It's symbolic of what a, a power a single river has. But when two rivers join, you know, the power yeah. is doubled. It, it simply means that the beauty of the river becomes blue and green instead of being only blue or only green, you know? Mm. So we have, we, it is special. Yeah, uh, for, uh, I was going to say the f forums like, uh, like the literary festival. Exactly. Yeah, any attempt to... I'm not this? interested in, uh, in communicating uh, praise for my book to our listeners. What I'm interested in, you know, why talk about the history of Lucknow here and now? Because there are so many interesting lessons we can learn to make our present life a little more gracious, peaceful, beautiful, mm -hmm. <laughs> loving, whatever, you know? That yes. is one good reason to talk about Lucknow. No, yes, that is it that you found time to uh, talk about these, uh, uh, to talk about these realities, good and bad, and absolutely uh, wonderful conversation with you. And uh, I have to again tell you that, you know, everything we know in Lucknow about Lucknow is largely through uh, the lifetime of research and writing that you've done on this wonderful city. And I hope um, uh, someday, you know, the madness uh, stops and we realize, you know, what we are doing to ourselves, not merely to the city, but what are we doing to ourselves? Uh, that is a note enough to um, end this evening's conversation. Um.